Seven steps of true grit for a faith that won't quit. Doesn't that sound good? Seven simple steps of true grit for faith that won't quit. I want to give these to you in bite-sized pieces. So I'm going to give them to you one at a time. And we're going to step right into this. There are stages to step-by-step -step work your true grit for a desired outcome. This will work for family, relationships, career, academia, athletics, the arts, starting a business, starting a ministry, getting out of trouble, dealing with depression, deciding to get married, marking an investment, um, you name it, these are stages of working true grit. Step number one, stand still. I know, doesn't that sound simple? but it's a little bit more in depth than that. But number one, stand still. You see, Moses and the people of Israel were caught between Pharaoh's deadly army and the Red Sea. Trapped, they were stuck, they were feeling completely hopeless. Moses calls on God and here's what God gave Moses as an action step. Check this out. Exodus 14, verse 13. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. See, Moses was telling the people what God had told him. Moses had gone to, the, to Father God and said, what am I going to do? I got all these people. You brought them out here to kill them. And so now God gives Moses the word, and now Moses repeats to the people. Here's what we do. First of all, stand still. Do not be afraid. Stand still. You know, sometimes when you're afraid, you get frantic and you just start flailing. You just start going here and there. Stand still, God says, and see the salvation of the Lord, which God will accomplish for you today. Did you know God wants to accomplish something for you today? That's right. So stand still. Quote, I got to put it in parentheses. God's telling you, stand still and see what I'm going to do for you. Part of true grit is knowing when you're drilling in the wrong direction and you've got to stop. You've got to stand still, not quit or give up, but stand still. See, there's a huge difference. Some are so addicted to busyness and activity that pulling over, stopping and getting some stand still, getting some direction going on is just downright painful to them, right? In 2 Chronicles, King Jehoshaphat, he heard the same instruction. Stand still, Jehoshaphat, and see the deliverance of the Lord. Notice, standing still is as much about dealing with your fears as it is seeing what the Lord accomplishes for you. Seeing clearly is eliminating the wrong perspectives, fear and anxiety, and then adding the right perspective, trusting in the Lord, confidence in the Lord. There's a duality to it. Standing still is letting go of your fear perspective, but getting a hold of your faith perspective. Psalm 37 verse 7 says this, Be still and rest in the Lord. Wait for Him and patiently lean yourself upon him, fret not. Look at that. Coming from the, from the, the giant slayer himself, fret not. You got to learn how to be still and rest in the Lord. It takes grit to be still and put your trust in God. It takes grit to patiently lean on God. My friend, it takes grit to fret not. You can't be in faith and be in worry. The two don't mix. And that's why the art of standing still is such a step in exercising grit. Standing still is a grit action, a grit step that helps prepare you to be proactive. Most people in crisis are reactive and then they compound the problem. You don't want to do that. The gritty are responsive because they stand still to understand and to prepare. You can't be moving frantically and also leaning on God at the same time. So as I said, grit step number one, stand still. Here we go. Grit step number two, stretch. First one was stand still, now stretch. Difficult circumstances are often referred to as being in the fire. It's called a trial by fire, we say. Did you know that you can stretch metal in the fire? You can shape metal and the hardest substances in the world in the fire. Wrought iron melts at about 2,700 degrees. Too often, we are quick to pray away trials, tribulations, and the heat of the fire when that is the perfect place for you to get stretched, to stretch. I like what Oliver Wendell Holmes once said. He said this, a direct quote, Man's mind 
once stretched by new ideas, never regains its original dimensions. Ooh, isn't that powerful? God has plans to grow you. He's got plans to shape you. And yes, God has plans to stretch you. It's important to your growth. It's important to your future. Stretching. James 1, verses 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, or I would say the heating up of your faith, produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Oh, that's true grit, my friend. I'll be honest, this portion of Scripture used to really bug me. Why? Because I had a hard time wrapping my head around the idea of being joyful in trials and testing until I realized that God's end game is having us lack nothing, being perfect and complete. Patience has to be developed, which requires the stretching of your faith. Faith is an amazing, powerful force. God has given each of us, but it has to be shaped and grown by stretching. That requires heat, fire, furnace, increased temperature, not to destroy but stretch and grow. Nobody who goes to the gym expecting increases despises the pain. Did you know that? Grit counts the, the cost and stretching is part of that necessary price that we all pay. This may seem a little peculiar to some, but stretching is taking your stopping to the next, the next level. You're increasing the blood flow when you stretch, so to speak, without changing location. So you're still stopped, but you're moving. You're, you're not atrophying. You're preparing for movement. Athletes, they stretch. They stretch before, before performing. Singers stretch and warm up their vocal cords before performing. Business people stretch by taking calculated risks, even with their time, so they can expand their thinking. If you fail to stretch an exercise, true grit, you will atrophy in your thinking, your believing, your movement. You'll end up compressing your heart. That's when bitterness causes you to really atrophy. There are people who claim to be in faith, but they're really in bitterness. They're not deep breathing anymore. They're not willing to stretch or move outside the routine of their comfort zone. Stretching can be uncomfortable, yes, but in a healthy way, it should be self-inflicted discipline where you force yourself outside of your comfort zone. You stretch. Before you start moving, discipline yourself to stretch. Breathe in God's word. Exhale those fears and anxieties. Breathe in God's praise. And exhale all the criticism and the fault finding that you have in your heart. Even toward yourself. Some people are so critical of themselves. Discipline yourself, but don't criticize yourself. Stretch your thoughts toward heaven and set your mind there. Think on what is true, honorable, righteous. My friend, that is a serious stretch for most of us. Stretch your attitude toward a heavenly attitude. And remember this, grit step number two is the stretch. Grit step number three, speak. You got to speak your faith. When you speak your faith, you authorize your faith to work for you. You confess your needs to the Lord. And Philippians 4 verse 6 says to articulate your petitions and your requests to God with thanksgiving. You know, thanksgiving is a powerful force of a spoken word. Did you know that Hebrews 13, 15 says a sacrifice of praise is defined as the fruit of our lips giving God thanksgiving. God actually calls your thanksgiving a sacrifice of praise. True grit takes over your talk, your speaking, and helps you align with God's word. Our flesh longs to testify to the feelings and the circumstances, but resist that. Say what God says. You got to say what God says. Speak faith, not doubt. Speak life, not death. You've got to persist to hold on to faith. Look at Hebrews 10 verse 23. So let us seize and hold fast and retain without wavering the hope we cherish and confess and our acknowledgement of it. For he who promised is reliable, sure, and faithful to his word. Encourage yourself in the Lord. I mean, self-talk. Self-talk is important. Speak the Lord's prayer out loud. Yes, as James says, you should always be quick to hear and slow to speak, but calling on God and asking for help is a top priority. It mobilizes your humility and your faith. It's not speaking just to keep talking. 
right? The whole goal is to articulate and ask God for wisdom, ask him for help, direction, correction. And this speaking sets you up for the next step of true grit. So simply do this. Find four scriptures that answer the challenge that you're facing and then write them. Put them everywhere that you're looking so that you'll profess your faith. Put them on the mirror. That's what I used to do. I used to write them on the mirror. You look at the first thing in the morning. Put them on your desktop, on your wall, the dash of your car. The goal is to have God's word specifically dealing with your situation fresh on your lips at all times. If it's something like 1 Peter 2, 24, then say it like this. By Jesus' stripes, I am healed. I said by Jesus' stripes, I'm healed. Make it personal. If it's Philippians 4 verse 19, then say it this way. My God liberally supplies all of my needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father. Say it, say it, and then say it again until all you do is think it, think it, think it. That's true grit. Step number three, speak. Grit step number four, specialist. Now this one's really good. I like this. Get counsel, get wisdom, pursue understanding. Look at Proverbs 11 verse 14. Where no wise guidance is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. As the saying goes, everyone needs help, but only the wise get it. Asking for advice, counsel, and wisdom is evidence of humility. And Proverbs 22 verse 4 says that with humility and the fear of the Lord is riches, honor, and life. God gives gifts and talents to people. God gives special gifts and endowments to the family of God for our edification, our encouragement, correction, and direction. Take advantage of them. Don't be independent of wisdom and understanding. That's a fool stand. I spoke with an extremely talented and gifted man in the area of business, and he told me of two people in his life. One was a young protege who sought his counsel and expertise, applying it to every business and relationship decision. The young guy was prospering and advancing at a lightning pace. The other person in the businessman's life was a know-it-all, I'll do it my way kind of person who kept running into failure after failure, insecurity upon insecurity, and more than her share of trouble and bitterness. Fear seemed to rule her life. Both young people are equally loved by God, and both are more than talented and capable. The only difference is one is willing to get a specialist, the other refuses and is stubborn to resist the specialist's advice. This is an easy step for you. Don't be stubborn or stupid. Be humble and, ref and reference God. <laughs> Hear his word and get a qualified specialist in your area of need and direction. If you're about to get married, get a marriage expert where you actually love their marriage. You admire their marriage. If you want to run a marathon, get a running expert to coach you. If you want to be financially wealthy, read books by true wealth experts. Talk to wealth experts. If you want to be um, drug and alcohol free, get a godly expert who has overcome drugs and alcohol and then model them. It takes grit, true grit, to get experts and specialists in your life. But exercise your God-given true grit and submit to wise counsel of specialists. That's grit step number four, specialists. Grit step number five, study. Meditate on what God is teaching you. Nobody is exempt from studying. Now you can tailor your studying technique to the way God has made you because we're all unique in how we learn. Some are audible learners. Some are visual learners. Some are logical, mathematical learners. And then there are physical learners. None of it is wrong just as long as you're learning. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. What a great um, admonition that the Apostle Paul gave to Timothy. Why do we need to study? To rightly handle the word of truth? Because too many times it's handled wrongly. When you wrongly handle the word of God, you end up missing the good benefits yourself. But even worse, you end up leading other people astray. And that's not good. So study the word of God. It's a treasure map to the blessed life. It's the owner's manual to your design. The principles and the precepts, they cannot be overstated. They are that essential. But there are other expert areas in your life where you need to study and apply. If you're going to be a doctor, you definitely need to be studying biology 
right? Part of true grit is meditating and studying the basics, the basics of even God's plan for your life. A little trick I've learned is to record myself reading God's word or specific truths that God was imparting to me. Maybe it's on the topic of love. Well, then you record yourself um, then you record yourself quoting everything from John 3.16 to John 17.23 to 1 John 4.10 and 11. And yes, it takes a little true grit to discipline yourself to get the good stuff recorded. But believe me, you'll never regret it. That's grit step number five, study. Grit step number six is strategy. Oh yeah, you got to have a strategy. You got to write down your strategy. You got to put your steps down in a document so you can see the culmination of counsel, advice, and wisdom shaping and guiding your movement. See, it'll begin to take a form, a shape. This is the blueprint showing precisely where you're going to drill, where you're going to drill for that gold. This should have actual practical application to it. This is where your specialist advice and all your studying come together in an actionable, actionable plan to do things. So you should have numbers in your strategy, things like dates, units, amounts, frequencies, that kind of thing. For example, if you're planning on getting in shape and working out, how many miles are you going to start walking or running? And is it every second day? Is it every day? What time are you going to do it? And then how do you want to grow that measurement? How much weight are you going to be exercising with? Where are you going to start? What's your goal? What's your plan? If you're going to be drilling a gold mine, this is the budget for the money that you're going to spend to drill and how are you going to recoup your investment? You can use this in ministry too. You see, it's it, like the saying goes, plan your work and then work your plan. Habakkuk 2 verse 2 says this, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and engrave it so plainly upon tablets that everyone who passes may be able to read it to easily and quickly as he hastens by. You see, he said, write the vision. It was like he was saying, write the vision, write the strategy, write the plan, engrave it so that everybody can see it line by line. Any expert on productivity will tell you that you can increase a day's output by extreme percentages by writing down your priorities with simple 20 minutes of strategizing every day. Isn't that awesome? Be intentional about your intensity. Be intentional about your time. Be intentional about your movements, your money, your words, your thoughts. The ball is in your court, my friend, so be intentional about strategy. Grit step number six, strategy. Grit step number seven. Oh, I know you've been waiting for this. Simple, steady and diligent. Grit step number seven, steady and diligent. As Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, he made a habit out of telling his children and his grandchildren the story of the tortoise and the hare. He even told it to Dave Ramsey when Dave asked him for advice on how to grow his own success and move forward and upward. Mr. Cathy would say, you know, something interesting happens. He said, every time I tell this story, he says, I notice that the hare always loses the race. And he says, the tortoise always wins the race. Isn't that funny? The tortoise practiced the simple principle of steady and diligent. Mark 4, verses 26 to 29. And this is Jesus talking, and he said this. Then he said, the kingdom of God is like a man who throws seed on the ground. And he goes to bed at night, and he gets up every day, and in the meantime, the seed sprouts and grows. And how does it do this? He does not know. The earth produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head of grain, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop ripens, he immediately puts in the sickle to reap, because the time for the harvest has come. Jesus is promoting the principle of steady and diligent as a kingdom of God essential. The desire for instant anything is not a God-born desire. God loves process. Even love, my friend, is a process. Instant pancakes, instant oatmeal, instant potatoes, oh, gross, instant milk. These are all products of the I can't wait for the good stuff culture right? Getting your food microwave may seem convenient and quick, but that doesn't make it right, healthy, or good. No, 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 no. God didn't even make the Garden of Eden instantly. Did you know that? He planted and grew the garden. God used some grit. Steady. Proverbs 21, verse 5. The thoughts of the steadily diligent 
tend only to plenteousness, but everyone who is impatient and hasty hastens only to want. You see, it's the difference between those with grit and those without grit. Steady and diligent is the picture of not loosening your grip of courage. Faith doesn't let go. God honors diligence of obedience, not speed and busyness for the sake of activity. We live in a society right now that's addicted to busyness and activity, but dying for the lack of growth. Be steady. Be diligent about doing good. You see, that's true grit. C.S. Lewis said, failures, repeated failures, are finger posts on the road to achievement. One fails forward toward success. One of the most inspired authors and writers of all time is telling you and me that we're going to have to exercise true grit and be steady and diligent regardless of our failures. Galatians 6 verse 9. Let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time and at the appointed season, we shall reap if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. What a picture of steady and diligent. It doesn't sound romantic, does it? But it's the secret to the most truly romantic love stories. You know, it doesn't sound super strong, but it's the secret to the strongest legacies and character. It doesn't sound talented or successful. But it's the real secret of overcoming and being a championship winner. Have you got a dream? Work your faith. But my friend, you're going to have to work true grit. Grit step number seven, steady and diligent. True grit.